Well, good afternoon, everybody, and by a good afternoon, I mean good morning. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. I hope everything's going well with you. The local time is 11.46 a.m., and I'm staring at a young Chris Crane eating his fourth Vinman's scone, choking it down, forcing it down, even though there are people with sad eyes out in the lobby waiting for it. They, there's no food for them because of this MFR. All right. We're five by five? Very good. Oh, let me read the title slide to you. Welcome to this talk. My year as a Fulbright Scholar in Norway, exploring dust deposition on Svalbard glaciers and advancing sustainability in teaching. This is a colleague, Susan Kaspari, who will be giving the talk today. Thank you for joining us. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us live. The local time is 1147. And if you're watching this in replay, you can skip ahead. You can fast forward about 13 minutes to the beginning of the program. Most of you be watching this in replay form. And there'll be a chapter title right at the beginning of Susan's talk. You can skip through this live part. You can also skip through my introduction and my announcements and go right to it. Looks like we're five by five. Where are you viewing from today? Say hi to a few of you, and then we'll swing the camera around, give you a sense of the room. We've got, I think, a number of Susan's relatives here and friends and neighbors from Ellensburg, and a bunch of visitors, in other words, today, in addition to the usual. San Clemente, California. Hello. Hello from the UP of Michigan, says John. Bergen, Norway. We're talking about your turf today. Dorset, UK. Fabian, Alberta. Exmouth, UK. Houston, Texas, Webb Lake, Wisconsin, Salem, Oregon, Birch Bay, Washington. Alberta Gary is here. Stockton, California, North Little Rock, Arkansas. Good old Vancouver, Washington, or Vancouver, BC, perhaps. Santa Monica, California, hi, Jack. Zoltan is in Budapest, Hungary, hello. Glasgow, Scotland, that's Gordon, he's a regular. Yuki, hello. Five by five, thank you for that report. Fairwood, Washington, Vancouver, Washington, Dayton, Ohio, lovely gray Ballard, says John. It's pretty gray around here too. Every day is about the same. I haven't seen the sun in about three weeks. It feels like at least. Pat and Natchez, thank you, Pat. You're not gonna make me cry again today, are you? Puyallup, Washington, Oyen, Alberta. Remy is in Norwich. Uh, Brian is in, from a few blocks away, or no, whatever. Anne's in Reno, Nevada. Tualatin, Oregon. Oklahoma City, that's OKC. Nina is in Norway. Lyle, Washington. Jacksonville, Oregon. We've got about 150 live viewers, and folks continue to pour in as well. So it looks like we're functional. I appreciate that. And uh, we'll swing the camera around, let you enjoy and get a sense of the room here. And if if you're new to these Friday noon talks, I'll be up front. Why not? I am on purpose showing the geology department here. It's been a while since I've said this, but I feel like I need to remind some of you or maybe tell some of you for the first time. This is basically recruiting. Recruiting for young people to come study geology here. And thankfully, our geology department to date is quite strong and healthy with a lot of students, in part because of the visibility that we have through this YouTube channel. There are other geology departments around the country who are struggling or even out of business due to lack of enrollment. So if you're, if you're enjoying these Friday noon talks, that's wonderful, but it's more than just the talk. It's showing you physically, audibly, visually, what this place is, and you yourself can be in this room if you're a young person, or even if you're an older person, you're welcome to come and join us. Okay, enough of that, thank you. Uh, we'll start the program in a few minutes. Hot mic. There's Sharon, uh, Sharon's in Malaga. All right, swing the camera around, boy. up my 
mess here. Is this going to work for you, Mr. Kaspari? Okay. I don't know. You think the lecture will be worth it? <laughs> My daughter would kill me if I said that. <laughs> of course it will. She's so yeah, good. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. She, she is so good. Around. She's oh, going yeah. back to Norway again. I can't believe it. <laughs> yep. She's going to get frequent flyer miles going back and forth oh, over God, that yeah. ocean. Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. <laughs> She's, she what? You know, I just read a, a novel about I, by an Icelandic author about a criminal and I thought, oh, Reykjavik and yep. Reykjavik, I guess uh -huh. that's how uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. yeah, it's been interesting. Nice. Sit down. Okay, you bet. Awful. Make yourself comfortable. It's true. That you're here. Yes, yes I am. It wasn't just a rumor. <laughs> hey, you guys. Let's do the old, le let's do the left-hander. Here we go. You too. Are you both working for geoengineers? We are. No shit, really? Yep, no shit. It's pretty awesome. I knew you. I live off this Tacoma office. Ah. I live among the basalt. And I live among the Puget Sound junk. So I'm wearing a microphone right now and it's, it's broadcasting. Oh, excellent. So is it true? That you can get a job if you major in geology at Central Washington it University? It's we true. both have bachelor's degrees and we did it. Yep. You can absolutely get a job in geology. <laughs> yep. And we're proof of it. And good yes. jobs too, I think. Like Very good you guys job. are Great like job. killing it. Yep. Nice. We're enjoying it a lot. <laughs> have you guys seen each other physically, even though you're working for the same outfit? Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so what what have you been doing so far? Is it like geo uh, like no? Is that geothermal or is it groundwater or what? What's At Central or, or in your jobs in general since you started? So I'm in the environmental discipline. I deal a lot with contamination and remediation. Nice. And then I deal with the clean groundwater. We don't do remediation. We make new wells. We clean old wells. Um, we do water supply evaluation, just help people get water. But both are water related. Did you both take hydro with Carrie? I never took hydro. No. <laughs> I did research with Carrie though, so that helped. Okay. Yeah. Lots of water related, groundwater, wells, drilling, soil. Yeah. We have some cool um, equipment and samples that I brought with that you can look at later. That reminds me, I need to announce that you guys are doing your thing next hour, right? And yeah. I think the public's invited to come up. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. In fact, I'll probably live stream it, actually, now that I mention it. the day off. You don't have to do anything here. No. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kick back. Yes. Yes. Aren't I always? 
should we get some food just the three of us before Jordan and I do a basketball game? Do you want to come over and watch basketball? Barricaded in a little hole that's alone. Well, Jordan's the guy that brought it up. Let's just see if that's a a thing. Were you serious about getting some food this afternoon before we go watch basketball, or you just want to take take the afternoon off, take a nap? Just an idea. I don't know. It does sound kind of nice, but why do you want to do something? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to know if you were serious. I'm always serious. Okay. You you pick the time and place if you want to do it. <laughs> I don't know what Hannah says. Oh my God, you bring them in. What the hell? I <laughs> got like 10 of my mom's posse here. She's, uh, she's been working. So I'm, gl- I'm so glad we didn't reschedule you. I mean, that, they would have been pissed. That would have been, they would have lit this place on fire. <laughs> Residents um, here. Huh? Residents here. Oh, did he make it? In the back. Oh, good. I swear I saw him. There he yeah, is. Yeah. yeah, Sasha and I are friends. So she and I hiked this morning. So, but, oh, cool. But he was coming back from Olympia. So, yeah, I love her. So she's really great. But, yeah, that's nice. Okay. Okay, we are about to do this to you. Okay. I've got Seems one good. for you. And, and let's just do it. And then from that moment on, obviously, they'll be able to hear you. Okay. In fact, I can probably hear you right now. Don't say anything to me. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to say a couple other things that I forgot. So you are welcome to roam if you want to roam. As you know, you've seen speakers kind of wander. Totally fine. You don't have to be anchored right here. Um, The repeating the questions thing so that the home audience can hear it. Um, I'm not even going to really give the standard intro for you, I don't think. Like I know you went to Maine, and I don't know where you went before that. No, that's fine. No, she's. Will you introduce yourself? Like, are you from? Do we want to? We can do it. You want to speak? (laughs) You went to Boulder and then Maine? You went to (laughs) Colorado? uh And you grew up in Colorado? I grew up in Colorado, did my undergrad at University of Colorado. All my grad work was in Maine. Okay. Oh, we just did it. It was fine though. We had a lot of fun, and we got to talk about our proposal. So that's super cool. Yeah. When is it due? Oh. March first. Aren't you writing one too? July. July. It's kind of floppy. I don't know. We need we need that going to your mouth. I don't know how else we can do it. I need like that a outfit. lanyard or something. <laughs> I can try to get it on my bra. We're good. Uh, can you hear uh, Susan, please? Susan by five by five. Susan, five by five. There's a delay here. Five by five for Susan, please. Well, I'm going to teach on a course. Five by five, both. And then on the way back, I'll stop and visit my collaborators and say. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, on the plane? I it's only five pages. Okay. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I bet you could win that out. No, but. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to be. I, I couldn't do that. I feel like you totally could. They can hear her. We're good. You just can't take a day, take it, you can't take a day off. There was something, I just came over. There was something else I wanted to say to you guys. What was it? Pointer, mic. Moving, advancing. Does this work? The advancing work for you? Oh, sorry. Hey, Jim. Okay. Thanks. Well, thanks for coming. I know you just got in, so thank you. Thanks for coming. I <laughs> know. Uh, 
I think we already did it. Okay, we're good. We'll go for it. Thanks. Oh, a self-quieting group. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming. Man, we got full room. Absolutely full room. Give yourself a round of applause for all being here. Before I forget, there's another program at 1 o'clock today. So immediately after Susan's talk, if you're still in the mood to learn more geology, up in room 206, uh, Bree McGinnis is teaching Geology 487. And there are some alumni from our program who are here today. Catherine, Rhiannon, and Bridget are all here from different offices of geoengineers. And they will be talking about their professional lives. And the public is invited to come up at room 206. So kind of a career workshop-y kind of a thing. Um, you are welcome to, to just keep rolling uh, with the program. Uh, there is no uh, dinner or whatever this afternoon. So we're just going to hang out here. And if you want to visit with the speaker immediately after, you're certainly welcome to come up and, and get some one-on-one -on -one time with our speaker. Uh, you are welcome to come back, of course. We have two more talks this winter quarter. Next Friday, nothing happening with us. Next Friday, no talk. Two weeks from today, February 9th, Marie Takach, who's up on the third floor. To mix or not to mix, details and timing of magma storage and recharge and eruption at Misty Volcano in Peru. Please come to that two weeks from today. And we'll take another few weeks off. And then the last Friday of the quarter, I think, March 1st, uh, Anthony Schoen from Spokane will be here electrifying CWU's heating system with geothermal energy. That's an exciting project happen, happening on campus. Uh, president um, Wolpart is here as well, so it's great to have the CWU president present with all of these sessions. I'm pausing. I wanted to say something else. Oh, yeah, it's the same thing I couldn't <laughs> remember last week. If you can't hear, get up and move. We got empty seats right in the front. If you can't see, get up and move, man. That's on you. Please, come on up. Don't be shy, all right? Wonderful. The speaker today grew up in Colorado. She did her undergrad at the University of Colorado in Boulder. She went on and did some schooling at the University of Maine, and she has been here on campus for more than 10 years. And we've been so lucky to have her doing her magic up at the ice core lab and everything else. The talk today from Susan Kaspari, my year as a Fulbright scholar in Norway, exploring dust deposition on Svalbard glaciers and advancing sustainability in teaching. Would you help me please welcome Susan Kaspari. Well, thank you all for coming. It's really fun to see the cross section of the community here. I've got my parents and husband here and a lot of my students are here and um, lots of colleagues from around town. And anyways, it's just really great to see everybody. Um, so we had an amazing year last year in Norway and I'm just excited to be able to spend an hour sharing with you about what we did. Um, so some of this is weeks. I'll talk about the experience from my family's perspective as well. Um, so I was away on the Fulbright and so I just wanna start by giving a plug for the Fulbright. So um, the Fulbright, um, it's, a, it's a program that allows exchange of students, scholars, artists, teachers, and professionals um, to be able to work internationally. And one of their catchphrases is turning nations into people. And I think that does a really nice job of capturing the experience that we had there um, last year, was, was really, um, really being able to uh, build relationships with a lot, of different, uh, a lot of different people, particularly for me professionally. Um, so anyways, just a plug, I mean, for some of my colleagues, but then also for students, because they've got these projects all around the world, and it is an amazing experience. Once you have your um, undergrad degree, um, you, can, you can go um, be a Fulbright Scholar. So something to think about. Um, so this is a picture of my family once we landed in the Oslo airport. And I just wanted to start with this because um, the amount of energy that was required to make this year happen was pretty immense. So um, we left summer of 2022, um, but summer of 2021, I was already starting to have to, I spent that summer writing the application to do it, found out the following spring in 2023 that we got it. Um, there was just a lot, we had to, the whole family on our own expense had to fly to California to get our visas. Um, we couldn't afford to rent a house in Norway and keep our house here, so we had to fully move out of our house. 
Um, we were only, I was only willing to consider locations where my dog was welcome to join as well. Um, so there you see her in the picture. Um, and anyways, it was a lot of effort for us to finally get here and we were pretty tired. Um, so I also um, want to acknowledge my colleagues at the Norwegian Polar Institute um, because it was the partnership with them that definitely made this project um, and my time there possible. Um, so this is Elizabeth Isaacson, um, and Elizabeth is a Swedish glaciologist but has been in Norway um, for most of her career. And the reason I reached out to them to see about doing my sabbatical there was that Elizabeth had offered me a postdoc. Um, and I'll talk later on about, briefly about where I ended up actually doing that postdoc, um, but it was an opportunity I'd always missed that I hadn't been able to spend that time in Norway. So it was really great to finally be able to realize that opportunity. And then this is her husband, Jack Kohler, also a glaciologist um, that is an American uh, that has been living in Norway for most of his career. Um, so they were two of my main collaborators. And then um, this is JC Gallet, who is a um, French snowphysicist, and I worked closely with him also. And so this, this was when we had taken a boat um, to the terminus of a glacier. Uh, so this is Tromsø. This is the town where we lived, and it was a really spectacular place. It was north of the Arctic Circle, um, so we got to experience polar night. So we had over the sunset in November and came back up end of January. Um, so we had a lot of experiences with that. Um, we lived uh, in a house down here, had just stunning views of the water, watching the cruise ships go and come by, watching birds while we would eat in the morning. Um, it was a beautiful modern Norwegian house. It was a really fun experience for our family. Um, I worked across the bay um, over here, so I would ride my bike up and over this bridge and then down to where I worked, and it was just a really cool experience. And Nick was asking me about my, my backpack. I can show you my backpack. I had to get a new backpack because it was so wet. A lot of, a lot of rainy bike rides living there. Um, so anyways, that's Tromsø. So that's where we lived. Um, really nice. Uh, this is a place called Fjellheisen. There's a cable car that runs up it, um, but that was really our playground. So we spent a lot of time, lots of mornings hiking with the dog there. Um, and then there was a valley on the other side that was just um, really phenomenal Nordic skiing. So we spent a lot of time there over the winter. Um, so this is my family after, shortly after we landed. So we did a trip out to Sunya um, and were able to have just a short amount of time before I had to get to work. Um, but just to orient you, this is Oslo. We were north of the Arctic Circle here in Tromsø. And then Svalbard is where I was doing most of my research. Um, so that was a really beautiful place. Um, so shortly after I landed there, after we, my family, we got settled in a little bit. And then I had to go to Oslo for a, a Fulbright orientation. Um, and that was a really cool experience. Um, we were at the Noble Institute, so it was a really neat opportunity to be able to just briefly be able to talk at the Noble Institute, um, knowing that some really impressive people had been there before me. And then this is the Fulbright cohort. Um, and we were able to see each other a few times, and then some of those people became good friends and we saw each other multiple times. Uh, so I have some gorgeous photos in here that are not mine. Oh, and it's covered up there. But this is, this is work from my husband, Jesse Cunningham, who's a photographer. Um, and we were, where we lived was over here. Um, but so that was a real highlight for him, was spending a lot of time being able to photograph Northern Lights. So my Fulbright was broken down when I applied for it. I, I said I was going to spend 65% of my time on research and 35% of my time on teaching. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about what I was doing for both research and for teaching. And then I also spent a fair bit of effort building collaborations. So some of that is talking about those um, collaborations that I built. And then I just want to end with showing some of our highlights as a family because it really was just a phenomenal experience for us as a family. So a little bit um, just as an overview of what my science is about. There's kind of two branches. So one of them is using ice cores as a tool for reconstructing climate and environmental change. And then the other thing that I do is look at basically things that make the snow dirty. Um, and I'll talk about this more in another slide here um, that cause things to melt more rapidly. Um, and these are pictures of examples in our backyard. So the table mountain burn where black charred material was darkening the snowpack and causing melt. I can do this. I told Nick I try to remember. 
<laughs> yep, and then, and then here where we're seeing snow algae. Um, so those are, that's really widespread. Uh, so just an overview of my, of my career trajectory. Um, I started as a master's student working in Antarctica. For my PhD work, I switched to working up um, in more the um, Everest and Tibetan Plateau region, um, did a postdoc in the Swiss Alps, and then I've been in the Cascades and um, had my family, started my family not too long after we got here to Washington, and so have largely stayed a little more grounded locally, uh, but my kids are 10 and 13 now, and so it felt like a time when uh, I could start to maybe go a little farther afield than I had felt comfortable earlier. And so I was interested in branching out and starting work up here in Svalbard. Um, and Svalbard, I'll talk about this in a minute, but it's one of the places or the place that's getting most impacted by climate change. So um, really interesting place for me to go learn about. Um, so light absorbing particles, uh, these are different things that get deposited on the snowpack. They can have human sources um, and they have natural sources. So there's black carbon that comes from incomplete combustion of fossil and biofuels, um, dust that's coming usually from rocky outcrops, um, arid regions or with land use change we're seeing increasing amounts of that, um, the watermelon snow or the snow algae, and then volcanic ash, especially in places like Iceland. And so what happens with that, this is showing, uh, what we're seeing here is, uh, is energy coming in from the sun. And when snow is really fresh and new, it's, it's very reflective. So 90% of the energy is reflected back out to space or higher. Um, but as the, that snow um, gets contaminated, that reflectivity really lowers. And so this is natural in some, um, in many cases, but with things like our burning of fossil fuels, that's producing some black carbon that gets deposited on the snow, or with a lot of the land use change or increasing aridity, um, that's increasing the amount of dust deposition. So a lot of the work that's been done in the past has focused, um, well, all of these things are being studied, but let me just say that um, since I started becoming interested in studying black carbon, which was towards the end of my PhD, um, black carbon got a lot of attention because black carbon is this really dark, very absorptive particle. Um, and so these numbers um, that are up at the top here, uh, those refer, th those, that's a metric of how absorbing those particles are. So if you look at, say, black carbon versus dust, black carbon absorbs way, way more energy. So it's much more efficient at absorbing energy, darkening the snow. Um, and so there were a lot of studies that have preferentially focused on black carbon, but the reality is, is that there's way more dust in the environment. Um, and so that'll set up um, for what I'm gonna talk about here. Um, so this transitions into the research portion of, of my talk um, on looking at light absorbing particles and snow and ice on Svalbard. Uh, so first of all, uh, why Svalbard? So the Arctic is warming approximately four times faster than the global average. Um, and so that's what's being shown here. We're going from 1950 to 2020. Um, here's kind of the global warming trend. And then this is the trend for the Arctic. But if you look down here, um, this is showing where this, the darker brownish reds are showing where the warming is greatest. And Svalbard is right in the bullseye of that. So the warming in Svalbard is five to seven times the global average. And so this place is just really kind of the canary in the coal mine in terms of being warmer and being um, an indicator of some of the change that we can anticipate to see elsewhere. Uh, so my colleague Jack Kohler and his master's student had this paper published. This is showing the Svalbard archipelago. And this is basically where it's red is showing the places that um, have had the largest amount of glacier retreat. And so uh, these Svalbard glaciers are, are uh, losing mass very, very quickly. And a lot of that has to do with changes in um, temperature, of course, changes in precipitation, but also the deposition of light absorbing particles. And so there's been quite a bit of work done in the past in Svalbard looking at, um, you can call black carbon, black carbon or elemental carbon, a lot of studies looking at that. And so we have a pretty good idea of how much of that is in the, is in, uh, is in the snow there. Uh, but when I was doing my literature review while I was writing my application for the Fulbright, 
there was like so little information about dust concentrations in snow. And so um, that's not true in all locations. There's a lot of places where this has been studied much more holistically, but in Svalbard, there was this major gap in the knowledge about how much dust was actually present there. Um, and then there's been a little bit of work that's um, also been done looking at organics, but people haven't been pulling these all together. Uh, so after seeing the science that had been done, I really wanted to focus um, on trying to fill in that gap of the dust. Uh, so this is um, just kind of what was known um, going into it. So, you know, some of the basic questions you'd want to ask is where is the dust coming from? So what are the sources? Seasonally, how does it vary? And then how is this dust deposition changing? And one of the collaborations that I formed while I was in Norway um, was actually with um, Biagio de Maro, who uh, is in Milan. And one of his uh, PhD students is going to be coming to Central and be working in my lab with me for May. Um, so you'll be able to meet Deborah in May when she's here working. Um, but he wrote a review paper that he invited me on that came out last January. And so um, this was just summarizing what our knowledge is right now about dust in Svalbard. So the dust is coming from both local and long-range sources, and the long-range dust sources can be coming from Eurasia and to a lesser extent Africa and Asia, and then Iceland and North America and Greenland are thought to be more minor contributions. Um, in terms of seasonality, it depends on the source. So the long-range sources are peaking during the winter and spring, whereas those lo the local dust sources, you can see in a lot of my photos that there's these rocky, these rocky outcrops that are, provide really great local sources of dust. Um, in the wintertime, most of that's it's frozen solid and it's covered in a fair bit of snow. Um, so during the wintertime, those local sources are really cut off, but there's transport that brings it in from long range sources. And then when everything is melting and much more active, that's when we're getting our local dust sources um, coming from Svalbard. And then how is dust deposition changing? We don't actually have a very good handle on this at all. Um, but what we do know is that with the glacier retreat that's happening, that we're exposing these big areas that are very good sources of dust. And I'll show some pictures of that later on. Um, and so we, we think that as we melt the snow and ice, um, that we could be really impacting the glaciers and the melt and affecting surface hydrology in this region. Um, so this is, um, this is getting more into the, the actual science that, that I was able to do while I was there. I like this picture. Um, these are a number of my collaborators. You can't see it very well here, but that is, you can see this guy's heads down. Um, we were doing, Jack has been monitoring these glaciers for a couple decades now, uh, monitoring the glacier loss. Um, and so this is one of his uh, stakes that they measure for GPS, but they had forgot one of their things, so they're standing on each other's back there. Um, which is kind of just typical of how work is done there. You, you figure out how to get it done. Uh, so, um, so as I said before, majority of work is focused on black carbon. And so my research questions have been, what are the relative contributions of black carbon, dust, and organics to snow albedo reductions in Svalbard? Uh, what are dust concentrations in the Svalbard snowpack? I was only able to find a couple um, reported values in the literature. There's just like no values of this. Um, what are dust deposition rates in Svalbard, and how variable are Svalbard dust sources optically, and how is the dust deposition changing? So this is, once again, this is a map of the um, Svalbard archipelago. So when you fly in there, you fly in here to Longyearbyen, um, and then I've done some work there that I'll talk about, um, but then we take another smaller plane that's about a 20-minute flight to get over to this research station, Neolison. And so this is a picture of Neolison. Um, this is a very international research base that has stations um, that are maintained from people or from different countries uh, um, from around the world. And so um, I, I know a number of you guys have seen this photo here, um, but there's of course polar bears in Svalbard. And what I had always been told was, was that you know, just be, you, when you're on station or when you're in Longyearbyen, you're fine, you know, because there's lots of people around. Um, and you just need to be careful, like you, you're not allowed to leave the periphery of these, of these places without having a rifle and being prepared to protect yourself. 
And so what I wasn't accounting for, um, many of you know I'm a super early bird, so I'm up super early in the morning and often going out birding. And so I was out at like 5 a.m. and the station was really quiet um, and I was birding. And then I ran, I like came over this little hill and there was, was this bear and her cub. And I was just like, oh God, what do I even do? Because no one had prepared me for that moment. Um, but I was able to get in. Um, the mom had her nose up and was sniffing, but you know, for the most part, they, they don't want to mess with us any more than we want to mess with them. And I was able to get into a laboratory um, and then watch them walk, uh, walk in front of me. And so I was able to get this picture. Um, but that was just, that was a couple days after my, that was like two days after I had arrived there. And so, um, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, better take this seriously. Um, so this is this one of the days when I got back um, from the field this spring. I was like, I should just take a picture of all this stuff because maybe I'll give a talk like this someday. Um, but this just shows uh, we would be really suited up to go out into the field. So, um, and a lot of this gear I'm used to using. So there's things like the harness that we're wearing for um, for tra for safety uh, for crevasse um, for crevasse hazards for traveling on glaciers avalanche beacon, um, satellite and radios for communication. But this whole thing was completely new to me. So I had never, um, never fired a gun in my life. And so I had to learn to file, fire a rifle, um, got certified to carry a rifle. And so, and then that's, that's a flare gun. So, I mean, I felt ridiculous because <laughs> I really shouldn't be, I shouldn't have a rifle. Um, so, <laughs> Anyways, that's, that's how I'd get suited up. And um, a lot of the work was, uh, I mean, th this is me I'm standing above um, one of the glaciers that's, that's retreating really rapidly and um, looking kind of oompa loompa-ish, being loaded down with all that stuff. And so the work that I was doing um, in the springtime, we were doing most of this either, well, most of this was happening by snowmobile in the spring. And then when I was there last, um, when I was there in August, um, there were some glaciers that we can access on foot, but some of them, because the snows melted, um, we could only get in by helicopter. So some of that was done by helicopter. Uh, so this shows um, a map of where I was working. Um, so Longyear Bien's over here. So most of my work with Nialasind is up here. So we were working on this peninsula and then on these glaciers here, Holta de Fana and Kongsvejen. And these are glaciers that have been monitored by the Norwegian Polar Institute for a long time. And then I'll talk a little bit later on about drone brain. Um, so the way that this worked is um, in the field, I brought my spectroradiometer with me. Um, a number of my students here got to use an education grade one the other week. This is my research grade spectroradiometer. Um, so we would start out by measuring snow reflectance. Um, then we would collect that snow so we can line up how reflective the snow was with what's actually in it. Um, here's JC where we're doing snow pit work with a helicopter waiting for us in the background. And then I was doing a lot of shallow core drilling. So that's me drilling a shallow core in the spring. Um, I'm not gonna go into details on the methodology too much, except to say um, that the Norwegian Polar Institute is really a, um, it's a institute that is specializes in, in getting into these places but they don't have an analytical labs. So while I was in Norway last year, I was really limited in what I was able to do. I couldn't do a lot of the geochemistry that I would normally want to do. So some of those samples I brought back to me and uh, brought to me, I brought back with me um, and hoping this spring um, to be able to have time to be able to work on some of those. Um, so a lot of what you're going to see um, is the super basic method where we were just collecting lots of snow, filtering it on filters, seeing how much particles were actually in the snow and then looking at those particles. So that's a lot of what I'll share, but someday maybe I'll give a fancier talk when I've got more, more, re, um, more results. Um, so this is what this looks like when we're actually measuring this. So then I'm using the spectroradiometer again. So I'll talk about this later. Um, so as I said, in the literature, there were just no measurements available about how much dust was in the snow. There were a few from places that were like gullies right next to dusty sources. But for where most of the snow and ice is in the archipelago, there were just no measurements of dust concentrations. So what I'm showing here is really pretty basic, but it was really important information to be able to get of just what are the dust concentrations? How much dust is actually getting deposited 
on these glaciers. And so, um, so uh, the answer is not a lot. Um, these are fairly low dust concentrations here. Um, but I was able to get information on what those dust rates are and then start to see some differences in some of the locations. So interestingly, like the low concentrations here are along these peninsula sites. And a lot of that lower dust concentration has to do with the bedrock geology. So th that is material that's not weathering as well. Um, whereas like up on Holta del Fauna and Kongsvan, um, it's a mixture of the winds being much stronger and then also a differences in the dust source, why we're getting um, higher dust concentrations in those locations. Um, so for me, it was a win. I actually had some data, like how much dust is here? Well, now I kind of know. Um, so there, were, there was information elsewhere about dust particles. So, um, so from some different studies here, a lot of these were, like some of these rates, uh, let me go ahead and put this in. Um, so this is actually looking at like per meter squared in a given year, how much mass of dust would get deposited. And so you can see, um, so my results here, we're looking at what's actually getting onto the glacier is, you know, somewhere in here, we're looking at um, half a gram per square meter compared to some places where they're seeing as much as four to five kilograms in places where um, they're in super, super dusty valleys. So this was useful information. Um, I was also interested in how the dust concentrations varied um, seasonally. So some of the, um, these are just from um, shallow cores that we were able to do and I show what those filters look like. So you can visually see um, when it's dustier. And then I was able to work um, on a glaciology course that I'll talk about again in a minute here um, with students to, um, to drill a couple of uh, like 10 meter cores where with at a site that's closer to Longyear Bin and a fair bit dustier. So those are the students drilling, the, uh, looking at cores in the field. And then um, we could actually visibly see some of the dust. So much dustier layers that you can see right here. And from satellite imagery, this is the glacier that we were working on. Like you can really see uh, that in this location here, you can just visibly see that dust that's getting deposited on some of those glaciers. And then the way to read this is, this is the ice core going from the surface, going with depth. So, and then you go here and go getting deeper, 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 going with depth. So you can see that it's kind of going from light to dark, from light to dark. And so we can visually see that seasonality and dust deposition. So greater dust deposition happening during those summer months when those local sources are really active. And so um, here's once again what that timeline looks like where on occasion we get these big dust events um, like was here during 2022. Uh, so the, this is something um, I started, uh, Oscar, who's my master's student, um, and I have been talking with Chris, uh, I'm starting to have conversations about, is just, you can see in these pictures over here on the right, um, these are all pictures I took while I was there, that the geology is really different in different places, like the mineral composition of that dust is going to vary a lot depending upon where you are. And so um, some of the work that I want to do is, is doing a much better job of actually characterizing the mineralogical composition of that dust. Um, and this is really important because the, depending upon the makeup of the dust, it's going to affect how absorptive it is. So you can have some dust types that are really reflective, some that are much more absorptive. Um, and sometimes we're just modeling dust. So this is, um, so some of my students, you should be able to recognize that this is snow maybe. Um, but this is looking um, at wavelength. So these are the visible wavelengths of light down here going out into infrared. And then this is the albedo or reflectivity. And so this is just showing snow, modeled snow, but with different kinds of dust from Greenland, Sahara, or San Juans. Uh, um, and showing that depending upon what the dust is, it can make um, a you know, couple percent difference in what you would expect for the albedo to be. So characterizing that dust is really important. So with the limited tools that I had available to me while I was there, um, I was able to, to measure just the reflectance of the dust. And so these are some of those um, filter samples that I collected while I was there. And so visually you can just see that, you know, certainly this is not all the same material. So local sources are controlling a lot of this. 
Um, and so this is, this is the same thing, visible wavelengths of light, what our eye sees going out into the infrared here. And then higher up on here is lighter and more reflective, lower down is, is more absorptive. Um, I mentioned before um, that idea of the snow algae. There is snow algae in Svalbard. So this right here is a chlorophyll absorption feature. So th that was cool for me that I can right away observe that some of these filters, these red ones, had snow algae present in them. Um, and I can see a little bit of that signature in the others. So anyways, these results are really preliminary and I'm hoping to work with Chris to be able to do more, and Oscar of course, to do more work. And undergrads, we're gonna probably need help this spring and summer. Um, but uh, th there's a lot to do there to actually characterize what dust in Svalbard is and how variable it is. Uh, so one of my major research questions that I said I wanted to do was, was look at the relative contribution of black carbon versus dust versus organics. Um, and so the whole point of this slide here is just that we're using values from the literature and values that we measured in the field um, to be able to have values to input into our snow albedo models. Um, and this is the snow albedo model. So once again, going invisible wavelengths of light out into the infrared. And then, um, and then let's just look at this one here because this is where we zoom in. And this is looking at if we just looked at black carbon if we just looked at dust as this red line here, or if we look at black carbon plus dust, and the take home message here is that dust is the story. Like there's so much more dust present than there is black carbon that all these studies that have focused exclusively on black carbon um, have been missing the point that you gotta look at the dust because you know if I have this much dust and I can pile on a fair bit of black carbon and it's not gonna change the energy balance of that snowpack. So this is really important. And then the, the final thing that I'm really interested in is being able to answer how is dust deposition changing? And so um, there's been, Elizabeth has been on projects um, uh, that where they've drilled deep ice cores from Holta del Fana and, uh, and I always butcher this one, but uh, Lomonasafana. Lomonasafana. <laughs> and uh, those ice cores, we expect with the glacier retreat and the increasing aridity that we expect to see an increase in dust deposition in these areas. Um, but this ice core, the best we have right now is calcium as a proxy for dust. And so this shows going from 1700 to the year 2005, um, this core is not suggesting that there's been uh, any increase in dustiness. If anything, there's been a reduction in that. But soluble calcium is, uh, you know, it also has sea, uh, sea salt sources from the ocean. And this is not the, the thing that we ideally want to be measuring. Um, here's going from 1920 to 1997 um, from another site. Um, and this is also not showing any clear indicator of an increase in dustiness. Um, so some of my colleagues who I'll mention in another few slides here, um, they drilled with the Norwegian Polar Institute and their own institutes, they drilled some, a new deep core last spring. And so um, I'm hoping uh, that I may be able to access some of that material to do the measurements that we need to do to really quantify how the dust has been changing over time. Um, so my preliminary results from the research portion is that uh, dust deposition on Svalbard glaciers is low during winter. Um, with higher deposition during the summer. The dust composition varies spatially and temporally. Um, black carbon albedo reductions are quite modest in the presence of dust. And so for the future work, I'm interested in figuring out more in terms of how important the dust, black carbon, and organics are. Um, this next one is really where I want to be putting more of my energy, is uh, we need to do a much better job characterizing Svalbard dust, so its size, composition, and absorption and then how dust deposition varies spatially. And we need to do um, more work to characterize the presence of importance of light absorbing organics. And then I want to be able to do a better job of looking at how this glacier retreat is affecting things. Um, yeah, and I should acknowledge all of this was funded. Uh, so some of this was funded by the Research Council of Norway. Um, I got an Arctic field grant to support one of the first trips I did there, the Norwegian Polar Institute Fulbright and then um, CWU through my sabbatical. Um, so these are a couple images that I, um, that I got from a colleague of a dust storm near Longyearbyen from last year, um, last fall. And so I'm actually going back next month 
Um, I'll be going back to work on a glaciology course there. And we're, I'm in touch with a couple of my colleagues. We're working on writing um, a Svalbard strategic grant to be able to fund doing more work there next year. Um, and so anyways, Oscar's going to be doing work with his shallow core. Um, next month, I'll be going back and getting some more material. And then we're writing proposals to be able to get more work. Um, so I'm going to switch gears now and talk. So as a reminder, 35% of my time was dedicated to teaching while I was there. Um, so this is a focus on my teaching in Norway. And a good portion of my time teaching um, was spent um, with Ola Subami, who is a, was a graduate student um, at the Arctic University of Norway, which is in Tromsø. And um, he's originally from Nigeria and hadn't spent very much time in the snow. So it was, um, it, so yeah, in the very beginning, we, we, we had to get him suited up properly to be able to take care of himself out there. Um, but so he did a project um, where we were, he was sampling snow up on that um, right above where I showed you where I lived at the beginning of the talk and then also down actually on the island of Tromsø. Um, and he was looking at black carbon and dust and um, he worked extremely hard and did a really good job. So he finished his field work at the end of March of last year, and he had to turn in his thesis at the beginning of May. And so it was a really, really rapid timeline. We basically had to do the full thesis in, in six months. And he got, they grade you like kind of a A, B, C, D, or yeah. And it's most students get C's, very few students get B's, and um, hardly anyone ever gets an A is my understanding, and he got a B. And anyways, that was, that was a high point is, is seeing him be so successful. Um, I taught, so I also taught a course um, at the Arctic University of, no of Norway. I was a guest lecturer on a course for two weeks. This was a module um, that I had developed previously, understanding our changing climate, the data behind melting ice and changing sea level. So I ran that course for two weeks at a university. Um, I also taught up at the university center in Svalbard. So I showed you a few pictures of the students before. Um, and that's where I'm going back next month to help on the course for about a week. Um, so this is the world's northernmost higher education institute. This is what it looks like. It's a really beautiful location. Um, and so they've got various departments. And so I'm working with the Arctic um, Geology Group. Um, so th that was the course from last year. And then uh, this is just pictures of the students when we were taking a break. So. Um, you know, we're snowmobiling a fair bit. Um, this, this is just stopping to allow people to be able to warm up. But it is, um, it is a phenomenal opportunity for these students to be able to be in this environment and interacting so closely um, with this place that's changing so, so drastically. And um, I'm sure some of you are thinking like, okay, you're studying climate change and you're flying to all these places. Um, and I think about this a lot and I think a lot about all these, these students are coming from different locations, mostly from around Europe. And I guess the hope is that you, you train and educate people to see the changes that are happening and that when they go home, they can be ambassadors for saying, look, like this is, this is so clearly happening. We can see it more clearly here than we can see it anywhere else. And, but this problem's being caused elsewhere. And so we've got to do the work elsewhere to try to limit how much impacts are going to happen here. Um, so I will, uh, yeah, so I'll be going back and working on that course, um, helping with the ice coring portion again for a little bit next month. Um, I also got involved in this group called iEarth. So it's the Center for Integrated Earth Science Education. Um, it's a Norwegian Center of Excellence in Education. Um, so this is me here, and this is Anders Schumacher, who was my main contact at the Arctic University of Norway. Um, so he involved me to get in, in, um, involved in this group. And so I went to this um, meeting and then ended up, putting in with, um, uh, ended up putting in a seed project to be able to run some sustainability trainings while I was there. So a lot of you know that I'm, I'm uh, very involved in sustainability efforts at CWU, and it is very much a passion of mine. I spent a lot of my career teaching students about all of the environmental and climate problems that we had. And, um, we just had that talk, um, Sasha and I were at the talk the other night on eco-anxiety, and it's really depressing. And, but when you switch it to focusing on the solutions and on the sustainability, that's where there comes real meaning and hope for me. Um, so I ran these workshops um, in 
Tromsø, Oslo, Bergen, and up on Svalbard at UNIS. Um, so that was just a little news article that they published on that. Um, and then there's pictures for, of this. Um, and I think if I look back on my year of where I think I had the largest impact, I think it was through these workshops. And so this was helping um, faculty at these other institutions do a better job of showing how geological sciences is at the forefront of helping us have a more sustainable future. Um, and uh, Heather, where are you? Hi. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I've told Heather this story, but Heather and I were working as um, provost fellows together a couple years ago um, and had developed this asset mapping tool, which I believe was, was your idea, and it worked really well here. It was where we were using all of the sustainable development goals, and this is something I'll be running this spring. We'll use the same activity. And so some of it is, is like, okay, which of the sustainable development goals uh, you know, applies most to the work that you're doing? And then we do this asset mapping where we say, okay, which community organizations are doing work to be able to support these SDGs and the sustainable development goals? It worked really well here. And I think it's been a really valuable tool to see like, you know, things like fish and um, the Wildcat Pantry and Helen House and all these different organizations are doing cool work to support sustainable development. And I did this, and this was a, an epiphany moment for me while I was in Norway. I did this activity and they all just wrote down the commune, which is their local government, commune, 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 commune. And it was like, it was so eye-opening of the difference of living in Scandinavia, where they've got this phenomenal social system and where everybody is housing secure, everyone is food secure, everybody has access to higher education. The government is taking care of everybody and everyone's basic needs are met. And so you don't need all these community organizations to be able to try to make sure that people are housed and fed. And so um, I didn't use that activity again, but um, <laughs> while I was there. Um, but it, anyways, I think this was my biggest impact while I was there. And um, UNIS, I, the timing of my visit there was really good where they ended up, um, they were just going under changing like their, their um, course and program learning outcomes. And so they were able to change um, all of their, their learning outcomes and course outcomes to be aligned with sustainable, with the sustainable development goals. And so that was really cool to be able to see that having that impact. Um, so um, the next thing was on building collaborations. Um, and so this is another part where I'm not proud of my carbon footprint um, in terms of I fully re realized the hypocrisy of all the trips I'm <laughs> going to show you that I did right now. Um, but this, um, I also was able to develop a lot of really nice relationships. And so um, this is up when we were doing um, some snow pit and drilling work. Um, but the, this was with a group, the people in the green are the Italians. Um, then there was the Norwegian group and there was a French group there. So um, really nice to be able to work together. Um, so early on in my time in the fall, I went to this um, ice, uh, ice core conference in Switzerland and also went to this ice memory meeting which ice memory is because we're losing so much of our glaciers, this is an effort um, to try to be retrieving as much ice as we possibly can and then putting it in storage. So we're constantly developing new methods um, for measuring the ice and increasingly non-destructive methods. And so the goal is to try to save as much of this ice for future scientists to be able to work on. Um, but at this meeting, um, so this is me and this is Elizabeth, who was my main partner and mentor while I was um, in Norway, and then this is Margaret Schakowsky, um, who's a Swiss, or she's actually German, but is, uh, has been in Switzerland for her entire career, and she was my postdoc mentor and who I worked with during my, um, during my last sabbatical as well. And so um, they've also, so all three of us are, are ice core scientists, but um, this, this photo means a lot to me because through most of my schooling, I was working under men and it was really, really nice to have female mentors. And so to be able to just meet up and be with both of them, it was, it's just really awesome. And they're both really great scientists and um, have both been really good to me. So I appreciate that. Um, as a result of that, um, that's how I ended up getting involved in this Dustin Svalbard um, paper. Um, so, you know, tagged on here. Um, at the, towards the end of the, the author list, but um, it was because of going to that meeting that that happened. Um, I went to the glaciology meeting in Uppsala um, and presented the work that I was doing there. Um, and then that enabled me to meet this PhD student, Lou, who there's this method I've been trying to figure out for like 
I don't know, seven or eight years. I've been trying to figure out how to separate the organics from the dust. And Lou gave a talk and I was like, oh my God, Lou knows how to do this. And so um, through um, the Fulbright, they have this inner country lecturer program. And so I was able to go down to Denmark and learn from Lou how we can separate out, this is snow algae and then the dust is at the bottom of this vial. And so like how to actually separate those things is super cool. So um, I was able to do that trip. Uh, the U.S. Embassy in Finland invited me to come for a week-long visit. So I, I did lots of outreach and meetings, to everything from school groups um, to meeting with government um, ministers at the embassy. So that was super cool. Um, I also went on the Fulbright Intercountry Lecturer Program down to Italy, where I visited colleagues first in Milan and then in Venice. Um, and this is Marco Potenza who had come up and met with me originally in Tromsø, was looking to form some collaboration. Um, and then we, s I guess we've met up four times now. Um, but so he, um, he invited me to come down to Milan. Um, I was the keynote speaker at a um, conference that they gave. I was able to see a lot of their methods. Um, and then Deborah, who's going to come in March, or March, May. Um, is he's actually at a different university. There's a few different universities in Milan, but they're all working together on dust and snow. Um, so anyways, that was a great, great partnership. Um, I got to meet with Senator Murray. So there was a congressional delegation that came to Tromsø. So I was able to have a short meeting with her. So there's me and Senator Murray. Um, and then I went back in November. So I went back for, uh, for a short trip where I presented the research that I was doing at the Svalbard Science Conference. Um, and I've talked to some of you about that, but that conference for me was really depressing because it is, um, it, it, like I said, it is in the bullseye of where climate change is happening most rapidly. And so it was several days of talks of just how, I mean, all these species that are being negatively impacted and all these ecosystem changes. And, um, and so, I, the following week I had stayed on because iEarth was having their meeting, their two day meeting again, and they'd invi invited me. So I ended up giving the keynote address and ran a workshop on um, creating a sustainable future through geoscience. And so that made me feel much better, like in terms of like, okay, how are we, how are we preparing for addressing the future? Um, so I just wanted to end the talk. Um, this was a professionally really productive year for me but it was also just an amazing year for my family and um, a lot of great experiences and a lot of growth happening. Um, so this is another one of um, Jesse's um, pictures here that Ama, my dad's wife, was at with us on this trip here. Um, so this is the Lofoten Islands. Um, and so just to using that beautiful picture to just kind of set off um, a little bit on a personal note of some of our highlights. Um, so this was my children's school. So this was the Tromsø International School. So my kids who are now 10 and 13 were able to go to this school and um, it was just really, really different than the US school system. And they were with kids from all around the world. They were learning Norwegian. Um, it, it, they were, my daughter had to play outside no matter what the weather was. And then it was really funny because then towards the summer, it, like we had a few days that were kind of warm and they kept the kids inside because, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, they, they were worried about that. Um, so anyways, this, the school was awesome and it's such a safe place that the kids had so much freedom. So they were able to take the public buses around the city and we just were able to let them free, free reign in a way that we haven't done here. And, um, and so there's been some things now where, where you know, it's hard to take that freedom back. Um, so this is Hyla and Cedar. Um, they joined the local Nordic Ski Club. And so this is them at one of the, um, they would have these really cool community evening races where everybody um, would come out and you can just start whenever you want, but like everyone in the community would show up to do these ski races and it was really cool. Um, we went up to Alta, which is further north. Um, this is watching the start of the Finnmarkslopa, which is the longest sled dog race in Norway. Um, so I know Tim's not here today, but Tim Melbourne had swung through and had seen us at that point. So he was, we're, we're um, all husky lovers. So we had gone and, and seen the start of this race. 
Um, I'm, I did not win this race. Don't let this picture fool you. Um, <laughs> but uh, this was me and two of the other Fulbright scholars. So we, I had to be in Svalbard at this time. So we did this, the Svalbard ski marathon, which was a really fun experience. Um, one of the highlights of the year, I think, for the, our family was this trip up to the northeast to this area called Hornoya. It's an island off the northeast, um, the northeast tip of Norway. Um, that's my son, Cedar, who's an avid birder um, shooting these pictures. Jesse's the one that actually took this. Um, but we just, um, we walked around with just stupid smiles on our faces for hours because uh, this place, I've never seen such abundance of birds. So um, there's, uh, there's like 100,000 birds there. I don't know that you guys can't hear it, but can you see all of those flying? And then here's one more. I mean, the sky was just packed with them. So anyways, that was very cool. Um, and then we had to move out of our house at the end of June. And so we finished the year just taking a month to, to road trip and to explore a little bit more of Norway. Um, so this is another one of Jesse's pictures of cedar um, hiking. Um, we just did a lot of hiking and exploring. The kids in front of another sad, very fast melting glacier with lupin. Um, yeah, lupin, lupin on uh, Lovind Island, a really spectacular place. Uh, Jesse and Cedar um, on Besagan Ridge. Um, we had a sickness that went through and kind of pucked us off one at a t after another. So Hyla and I weren't on this because Hyla had gotten sick and then Jesse dropped down next. So he wasn't w able to go with us, but this is, the highest, um, this is the highest mountain hut in Norway. And so the kids and, and our dog Lupin and I went up there and it was, it was like awful. Like this, the rain, it just like rained sideways at us. And, uh, but we made it up and got in the hut and we, we laughed a lot about how bad it was. But, but the, 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 the sky cleared a little bit and we got some great views, but it was funny. It was like one of our big splurges where we're like, okay, we're gonna, this is like $350 for our family to spend this night in this hut, you know? And so we were like doing this and then it was like so bad. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and then, yeah, and then just kind of finishing. This was at the very end of our road trip. So another one of Jesse's pictures of, of Cedar walking along the coast and another Northern Light photo from Jesse. So I just want to end, I, I put this code up if people are interested. Um, so CBS just did a really nice documentary like a month ago um, that is about Svalbard and how it's changing. And Jack and Elizabeth are featured prominently in that, as well as Andy Hodson. Andy Hodson is a British glaciologist who is the Arctic glaciologist whose course I teach on. And so he's, uh, he's in there talking a lot about work that he's doing in terms of melting glaciers, melting um, permafrost and methane release. And then there's a lot more information in this documentary about the actual glacier retreat that's happening. So that's like a 45 minute CBS documentary that was really well done. Um, so anyways, um, thank you for your interest in hearing about our year. Um, and I'm happy to take questions if there's questions. Questions for Susan, and Susan will repeat your question for the home audience. Yeah, so that's a great question. How do you tell the difference between the local source versus the far ranging source? So some of that you can look at somewhat by looking at um, like the particle size of it. So there's certain, you know, dust over a certain size isn't going to have made it across the ocean to be able to get there. So that's one aspect of it. And then there's different, um, there, there's different geochemical things you can look at to be able to get at the provenance of where the dust comes from. And, and there is that seasonality of a lot of the Svalbard dust is locked off during the summer months. Yeah. What are the lowest temperatures I was doing field work in? Not that cold. Um, 
I'm trying to remember. You know, it's all surrounded by the ocean, and so it's not it, it's not extremely cold temperatures. I mean, th there are times we would definitely get cold just because we were out for a long period of time. But and then I'm only thinking in Celsius now. So, anyways, but we certainly, you know, we're well below freezing, but not not frigid. Like when I was working in Antarctica, that was cold. This isn't that cold. Yeah. Anne. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Um, yeah, the comment, the comment for the audience. Kudos to me for actually doing it all. Um, yeah, it was, it was busy. It was not relaxing. When we got back in, um, we got back in August, and then we had to, we had to fully move back into the house, which the only nice thing about that was we got rid of a lot of junk that I didn't care about owning anymore. But, um, but we were tired. Like, it, I definitely came off of that year of just, it was so busy. There was nothing all that relaxing about it. And so I, I definitely needed some pauses before starting back up here in September and was thankful for that time. Other questions? Yeah. When you say dust, is that the same thing as the lus, like in the Palouse Hills? Is it the, the kind of kitchen flower silt, or is it finer than that? Um, it, it's similar, yeah. So I've been in touch. There's not very many people that are that are focusing on dust. So I've been talking um, with a Swedish scientist who's studying the loss around um, Longyearbyen, and then there's another group out of Denmark that I'm also in touch with that are putting out dust traps to be able to to look at the dust. Um, but yeah, it's it's similar, and so it's coming. Um, I mean, I'm I'm interested. So the work that I'm proposing right now is to, um, we're going to propose to drill a cores from a lot of different areas, but drilling cores on a number of glaciers that are closer to Longyearbyen where there is big depositions of loess, but also where there's these huge dust storms that happen. And so we want to know how much of that's actually getting on the glacier. Um, I don't have a map ha uh, right handy right here, but um, you know, some of the archipelago is really covered in snow and ice and others of that, most of that glaciers have retreated back and so you've got a lot of active dust sources there. Yeah, any Thank others? You. Yeah, in the back. Um, yeah. Does the area around Svalbard historically have sea ice or? Yeah, so did, was there sea ice around Svalbard historically? Yes. Yes, and, and like around Neolis and the research station that I mostly worked at, there, you know, everyone that's been working there for a while talks about how they used to always have sea ice there, and now most of that sea ice is gone. And then talking to the polar bear researchers, because there's some polar bears that you know, were going out and were, work, were, were hunting from the sea ice, and so some of those bears now are using different techniques where, they're, where they are they are getting their food more so from working on land because the sea ice isn't there, but they're not able to get as nutrition rich sources of food now. Um, I mean, they really need to be eating the seals to get all the fat that they need. Yeah, Sasha, did you? Oh, yeah, go ahead. So, do you think that the, the dark, the bullseye spot around Svalbard is because possibly the, the whole environment around the island has changed from maybe three quarters of a year of ice to? I mean, yeah, so the question is, is how much of that real warming, the bullseye over the Svalbard region is due to that sea ice retreat. And I mean that, so the retreat of sea ice where you're removing a really reflective surface and being left with ocean water that's much more absorptive. I mean, that's Arctic amplification is largely caused due to that. Um, Svalbard, you know, if you compared it to like Greenland, um, Svalbard is, yeah, it's low, relatively low elevation, and the, the waters are warming there a lot, and the, there's definitely much less sea, li sea ice there. So, yeah, it's definitely a factor. Yeah. What do you mean by artificial? Well, I mean, um, so if you were to just have the glaciers accumulating over time, you'd get a certain amount of dust, you know, 
Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Snow is melting. Does that start to concentrate? Oh, yeah, it's like in our cores and everything? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the question is, is, is do, you, do you get this artifact of where the, the amount of dust that you would like observe in an ice core is more than was actually, or looks like more than was actually deposited because that ice is all melting? Absolutely. And so we see that, oh, we see that here in the Cascades. So I've worked with the deep ice core um, from South Cascade Glacier in the North Cascades, and we definitely see the signal where the glacier started to melt a lot more, where the measured concentrations look a lot higher because it's spread out over less snow. And so then we do something that's called a flux correction, where you try to correct for how much snow is actually there. So then you can try to actually get at like how much was deposited over that area per unit time instead of what the concentrations were distributed over the snow. Yeah, good question. Hey, let's thank Susan one more time for an excellent talk. Thanks for coming, everybody. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Oh, you are pro. You are a pro. You're the pro. No, hey, that was <laughs> great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for all you do for oh, getting the word out about us all. So. Happy to do that. Yeah. Oh, that was excellent. Well, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Everybody, come on in here. Come on in. We should thank these guys. Uh, some of you saw the video that Hannah and I did, and many of you really came through. I don't know if we want to say a dollar amount, but it was a lot. It was a lot. Way so, more than we expected. So, so thank you. We, the bottom of our hearts. We can keep this going. We can get more speakers from out of town, out of state even, and uh, make it happen. Out so, of country. So thank out you. of country. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay, let's say a couple final words before we uh, say goodbye today. Yeah. Get, get the camera. Hope you enjoyed that talk today. Yeah, I was the one removing a few comments here and there, so we don't need to go in that direction, but that's a new thing for us. A mixture of, uh, we don't need to say anything, but yeah. Uh, this is supposed to be a positive environment, and we will make sure that it is. So, I hope you enjoyed that talk. Uh, you are welcome to come back to this noon Friday session. Two weeks from now will be our next talk. These are the two talks we have yet to go in our winter quarter, and you are welcome to come join us. I think we have more and more folks joining us from off the street, quote unquote, and you are welcome here. So February 9th and March 1st. And yes, the Ice Age Floods A to Z series continues as well. I'll see some of you Sunday morning at 9 a.m., a show with Sky Cooley. This coming Thursday, Larry Smith talking about Glacial Lake Missoula. And a week from this Sunday, Sean Wilsey talking about the Bonneville Flood. Thanks, everybody. The room is still so full of excitement. I'm just going to give you a couple final shots here. Thank you. Uh, we're still going. Thank you for coming. Wonderful to see you. <laughs> Same here, Rachel. You, you see you next time. time. You would maybe have to like sell yourself a little harder. Yeah. Right. Possibly, if, especially if this shift's cool. That's also a good reason to do that. So it's got to be the position. Okay.